our series on partners and employment. And we're very excited today to focus on, as they say, focus on the family. Um, we welcome Kathleen Considine, who is a mover and a shaker in the Massachusetts and also has been in the New Jersey NAMI. And uh, she's becoming one of the champions uh, around employment, which is very exciting. So we uh, welcome Kathleen, who is going to give us some provocative thoughts about family's role in uh, helping with employment. So I'll turn it over to you, Kathleen. And I apologize for the date of November 22nd, uh, but that was the original date. So it's really the 21st. Um, and Kathleen has been a social worker. I believe she's worked in an employment program in the past. Uh, she is a parent of a person with a mental health condition who is doing extremely well right now. Um, she has served in many capacities, um, both in New Jersey and Massachusetts. Uh, she also helps with her local group in Plymouth. You all know about Plymouth Plantation and Plymouth Rock. Well, that's where Kathleen is from. And she greatly appreciates the importance of employment and its role in recovery. So there's a little typo there. All right, so um, Kathleen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Joan. And hi, everybody. Um, so I think that I ought to first uh, put a little disclaimer out there that, um, that you know, this is my opinion. Uh, this is my opinion about my family. And many of the things that we'll talk about today probably translate as well to your family. Um, but a, a little a little background. I have been a, a huge fan of employment for a long time, but very quietly. And I think it's now time for um, for us uh, as family members to speak up, to make our voice heard. Uh, so by way of a little background on me, um, I come from a family tree that is really heavily laden with uh, mental health conditions. Uh, I recall that my parents used to speak about various people in both their families um, who were uh, quirky and had unusual behavior. Um, I, I lived in, an, in a, a sometimes very tumultuous home because my dad, who was very successful as an attorney, uh, lived with quite debilitating depression. And my sister, who was a couple of years older than I, was really lifelong never able to reach her potential um, because of bipolar disorder and um, substance abuse, uh, her, her addiction. She just had a terrible quality of life. So uh, I guess with that as a background, I became a social worker and married a very smart, well-educated man whose career was hampered by OCD. Um, and our daughter became ill at 19 years old when she was a freshman in college. So um, it's very different, I think, for a professional when their family is, is affected in this profound way, especially, I think, for, for a parent. Uh, I didn't feel the same way about my sister's illness as that great responsibility that I did uh, for my daughter. And uh, eventually, I did turn to, to NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And I'm very dedicated to uh, the NAMI mission, which is uh, to improve the lives of all peers and families affected by mental health conditions through programs of support, education, and advocacy. And my focus in NAMI, and it, it reaches way back, has been um, on education about mental health conditions in, for families as well as the general public support for families, and also to increase and enhance employment for peers through supportive 
um, employment programs. Uh, my daughter, um, I have always considered my daughter the expert on her illness. Uh, and, and for my family, that has worked uh, quite well. Um, the goals for today, you can see, uh, the first one is to recognize the value of family involvement. I cannot stress that enough. Other things may change us, but we start and we end as family. The second is to dispel myths about family involvement and also to provide strategies for families. Um, so let's kind of move ahead. You can, I guess that Joan is taking care of your questions and I don't mind being interrupted. Um, so why do we care about this? Well, I know why I care about it. And I'm not really sure who all is in the audience, who are providers, who are family members. Um, but I know that we all do care about this, or we wouldn't be here this afternoon. About 65% of people with mental health conditions say they want to work. 75% uh, are unemployed, but 65% of those people say they, they want to work. And I'd like to talk about some of the things that may be holding them back. Also, as far as Social Security, um, uh, mental health conditions uh, are the fastest growing disability for SSI and SDI. And typically, uh, when people with mental illness uh, get onto Social Security, they stay. Um, it shouldn't be so. Uh, they should be able to get on with the rest of their lives. Because meaningful employment can really promote recovery. You know, those incremental steps, the little, the little successes really build on one another. So let's look at some of the possible barriers uh, to um, why, why are these people are not working? That's 65%. Is it a lack of early intervention into their condition? Is it limited education? Criminal justice involvement? Symptoms? Is it access to services? Comorbid psychiatric conditions? Substance use comorbidity like my sister? Lack of accommodations on the job, failure to disclose, problems of concentration, fatigue because of side effects of the medication, problems in social relationships, having a mental illness and being a member of a minority, the level of functioning, no help in getting a job, stigma. Traditional vocation, vocational programs which are train, 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 placed versus what I support, which is place, train, train, and more support. Um, lack of transportation in my area of Massachusetts, that, that is a big issue. It may be for yours. Loss of benefits, um, disincentives about Social Security. Negative views about clients' ability to work. Discrimination in the workplace. Uh, prior work history. Um, there's a quote uh, by Thomas Edison that I enjoy a lot. That is, um, what did he say? I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 things that do not work. I love that. Um, Another barrier, lack of integrated mental health and vocational services, that's a biggie. Interactions between and among these barriers to employment. Uh, so, so, you know, there are many people who uh, experience all these barriers, most of these barriers, some of these barriers, and uh, that's quite telling. So let's move on to the benefits of competitive employment. 
certainly employment adds meaning to life. I think that we, uh, we would all agree with that. It provides opportunities to make decisions and choices and uh, to move people towards increased self-determination. It decreases symptoms, uh, promotes skill building and leadership. You know, if someone's really busy uh, at work, they don't, they, I, in my experience, in my family's experience, there is a decrease in symptoms. Uh, it creates opportunities to learn, to grow, and to recover, to extend the circle of natural supports in the workplace, on the job, certainly to reduce isolation and increase opportunities for socialization, to increase income. Everyone needs more money these days. You can't live on Social Security well. Contribute to the broader community, which I think that a lot of the peer community is certainly involved in right now. And to generate hope by providing, by proving that recovery is real. To serve as a role model for people living with mental health conditions. It's very inspiring for peers to see that other people uh, with mental health conditions are, are, are really integrated into the community and working. And we find that in NAMI in uh, programs like In Our Own Voice, in which uh, peers are trained to peel the onion with a variety of audiences to talk not only about their dark days, but their hopes and dreams for the future in a very realistic way. So, uh, and also to mentor others with mental health issues on reentering the workforce all of which uh, represents, uh, for me, for our family, a full community inclusion. So what is the value of the family uh, as a partner uh, in vocational recovery? Um, families do affect uh, recovery. And at the same time, families really are influenced by that recovery. Um, you know, it is, it is a, a kabuki dance between, between the two of the family influencing and then the family being affected. And as allies and navigators, families play diverse roles, um, but also require a, re, a variety of support. Uh, for example, um, with NAMI, the NAMI Family to Family Education Program, which is free and 12 weeks, and honestly is uh, quite life-altering for people who take it. Because to really be in a position to, to help uh, and be a partner, you have to really know what you're dealing with. Uh, so that so that you're on the same landing strip uh, with the person who who has the mental health condition. Um, and research has indicated that for families, just the idea of being there and available to help people in recovery is huge. And by families, I don't mean just uh, uh, a family in the traditional sense, but you know, the a village, the family of man, uh, friends extended family, uh, whatever. People who are able to stand alongside the person, um, people who uh, the peer can rely on and look to for strength, expectations, and knowledge when times are difficult. I know that that happened in our family. Uh, and there were those cases where my daughter did not feel Alone. On a very tangible uh, basis, very concretely, they, families can provide good information about employment resources and support. They can provide continuous emotional support and, and problem solving. I think that families affected by, um, by mental health conditions are excellent problem solvers. 
Uh, and at least in, in my family's case, you know, the things that came after, and I know that lots of families date things before and after. And after uh, our family became affected by this mental health condition, uh, we became excellent problem solvers. Everything else was like, oh, it's just another problem. Um, families going the extra mile to collaborate uh, together with their, their loved one and employment providers to enhance communication. <clears throat> I think that's kind of a new concept. At least it is for me. Um, I had the sense when our daughter became ill that I had to step back. And I kind of had the feeling that um, there was someone else who knew much, much better than we did. Um, and at times, I actually felt guilty about wanting to be involved uh, in, her, in her life, in her care. Um, I think we have to change that, particularly when it comes to um, vocational recovery. I think that we have to really stand up to the plate um, and be, be families. And be what, the, what families do, what all families do, is provide tangible support, uh, rides or uh, uh, lunch or help with, with myriad tasks. Um, so what are some of the misunderstandings about families involved in uh, employment? Well, the first one you see on your screen is that the, family, the individual does not have supportive people that they consider family. Well, we have just said. If there is no immediate family members to, to step up, there are family members uh, who are extended and friends. Um, peer support, there's, there's a huge amount of peer support out there um, who are inspiring and who, who, who can serve as role models. The second myth that you see um, is that the job seeker doesn't want family involvement. Um, you know, and I'm wondering on this, um, just as in treatment, how often consent is um, solicited for family involvement. And we have to be really clear that HIPAA is not at all involved in employment. Um, the third, the individual does not think families can be of any value to their vocational recovery. Well, you know, that may be true. Um, that may be true. But as we become better versed and more educated, we certainly do become um, more valuable in this, in this role. And there's a great book that many of you probably already know of by Javier Amador, who's a psychologist at Columbia and also family member. And the name of the book is, I'm Not Sick, I Don't Need Help, which kind of gives the idea that the person doesn't have any insight. And that may be true in some cases and may not be in other cases. But the real thrust of this book is to give us all a technique to <clears throat> be able to, um, to communicate in a, in a more effective way by uh, a technique that he has developed that he calls to leap, L-E-A-P. To listen, to empathize, to agree where you can agree, and to partner. And I think that this book and this technique is particularly useful when it comes to, um, when it comes to vocational issues. Uh, good drink. I'm not used to talking so much. Um, I'll just I'll just jump in here then and please. just say that you know the employment specialists, people who work in 
uh, employment uh, programs, I think you know we're very aware that um, it takes you use your entire network, both your personal network and your professional network, to help people find you know get matched to the right employment. And so to leave the family out as part of that network it doesn't make much sense. Uh, whoever the person considers family, and I think everyone has somebody they consider family, and to leave those people out, they're, they're critical. Everyone part of the personal and professional networks, um, both the job seekers and the, the staff members. Uh, it's the whole it's the whole Megillah. <laughs> you know, the, the, and, and the vast majority of people get their jobs through personal contact. But it's more than just getting a job. It's the whole vocational process. And people need support through the whole thing. There's a lot of ups and downs on the, the roller coaster of um, vocational recovery. And I think there's a new recognition, at least here in Massachusetts, with the re-procurement of uh, some of our services, uh, that family involvement, ha ha, will be routinely encouraged in recognition that families can be key allies in treatment processes, and their involvement can often facilitate better outcomes. That's huge, and we know it. It characterizes family engagement as a continuous process involving collaboration to determine what is the best level of family involvement. This model will presume family education about illness and the service delivery system. And that service delivery system is going to include employment. So how can families learn about ways to be helpful in vocational recovery? Uh, well, there are many sources of, um, of uh, I mean, there's so much information on on the Center for Psych Rehab uh, site. Um, you know, I, I, I want to apologize. Let's go back to that previous slide, Joan. What are some yeah. of the barriers to being helpful with okay. employment? Um, the first point there is uh, no one asked them to be a partner. That was me. No one asked me, and so I did not. I did not get involved. But I know better now. Um, they are repeatedly told there is no role for them. I, I never experienced that. Or that they cannot participate because of confidentiality. No, I, I didn't experience that. But I do know, um, and I do question whether providers realize the potential value of families to the individual vocational recovery. I just, I just, uh, I think that's slow in coming. But as I say here in Massachusetts, with the re-procurement of services, I'm hopeful that that, uh, that thought will be evolving. Um, so then we'll move ahead to families learning about ways to be helpful in vocational recovery. Well, BU has always had so much. Uh, I, I first heard about um, the possibility of people recovering, uh, returning to school, and and being employed. Um, when I heard uh, Bill Anthony speak several years ago in New Jersey, and it was the first message of hope that I had heard. And as a result of that, my daughter was able to enroll in a program at um, the center. Um, and at the time that she enrolled, she really didn't talk. Um, but 10 months later, when she graduated, uh, she gave the speech uh, and went from there to an unpaid internship and is now working for a, a mental health agency where she is able to, has been able to um, work with, with clients. She has her certified peer specialist certificate. 
and her CPRP as a certified uh, rehabilitation uh, practitioner. And, um, and she's a part of the team. And she, she, that kind of success, she has been working continually for 16 years now. Hmm. Um, so we've been at this for a while. And she does sometimes speak um, to share her story. And, and here I am today um, mm -hmm. as a family member who has really, I feel, been successful and fortunate in the outcome so far with, with our family. I feel that we are very, very fortunate. Um, but I think that you all can be too. And, and as my daughter says, it's, it's just all going to get better and better and better. So uh, the next slide is how can families learn ways to be helpful in vocational recovery? Well, one of the ways that has really worked for a number of people that I know is to participate in an army support group and talk with other family members. We learn so much by um, by sharing stories and sharing experiences. We have so many shared experiences. Uh, to speak with professional caregivers about vocational recovery. To enroll in a family to family class. That to me is uh, just the way to go. And I want to refer you to some research on the individual placement and support model, the IPS model that I support. Um, it is an article written by um, uh, Mike Cohen and Deborah Becker uh, about the family advocacy for the IPS Supported Employment Project. And I think that Joan is going to be able to send you a link to this article, but in it. Actually, actually, Kathleen, because of copyright, I can't, but I'm putting the information into the box right now. Oh, OK. All right, good. Thanks, Joan. Um, and you can see how some <coughs> NAMI groups really picked up the gauntlet on this and became pretty strong advocates uh, for uh, enhancing uh, employment services. And I'm hoping that, that we at NAMI will be able to do the same thing. And I'm also thinking that perhaps in one of our family to family classes, we can, uh, for our advocacy class, we can have somebody come and speak about employment. Uh, uh, and also, if we can have some, some text and some resources in class 10 advocacy, I think that would be a very good idea. Um, there's, as I said, there's so much at, uh, at BU's uh, Center, for Psych, Center, for Psych, Center for Psych Rehab site, that's hard to say, um, and also the University of Massachusetts on transitional age youth, and the University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. So also, I mean, each of us, is able to advocate and speak up um, and trust your instincts to advocate with um, the Department of Mental Health, Voc Rehab, Department of Labor, the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, uh, just a few weeks ago, the Secretary of Health and Human Services spoke at a NAMI convention and said, you know, get in touch with me. Uh, let me know how things are going. And so I, I do think the invitation is there, and we ought to um, take her up on that offer. We're certainly always able to advocate with our legislators. Um, there's a lot to be done there. And um, Individually, uh, with our with our family member, um, we know how to communicate with our family members. 
we know um, we know how they communicate. Um, we know what they're good at. Uh, we know what some of their uh, weaknesses can be, and and there are many many strengths to to share that information uh, with uh, an employment specialist. And actually, you know, I see on this also to uh, to file a formal complaint. Um, you know, sometimes that is that is necessary. Uh, but to advocate, advocate to know uh, for for our for our uh, person to be able to advocate for themselves, uh, for us to advocate for them, with them, and to speak up. Uh, I just think that that is the most important thing. Um, so I think that that pretty much uh, finishes up the slides that we have. Uh, are there comments? I think comments are more important than questions. OK. So I assume that we have a group that's uh, uh, comprised of uh, people who work in services, um, family members, and people who are persons in recovery. I'm just assuming that we have all of those. Um, so we'd like to hear from every all of those. And David, if you want to, you can unmute the phone so people can speak for themselves. Mute off. Or people can just hit star star on their own phone if they wish. Just be really careful about papers, rustling papers. All right, do we have anyone with a question or a comment? You can type it in the box or you can um, say it out loud, whichever you prefer. But before, your before you give your question, tell us who you are, like where you come from and what you do. Why don't we ask that? Well, it's about. Well, I think we have to say it. So, it's because the way you're in the family and CPS role, don't they mesh? Or am I off? I don't know if it's about involved in employment for a family member. Well, for. So, it's like you were helping somebody here. No, I think that we, we, we're hearing people in the background, but we're not hearing people speaking into their phone. So if you'd like to say something, could you say it into the phone? You know, I would like to ask everybody, how do you feel about families being involved? Is it more difficult to, uh, to involve families? Um, families, friends, uh, fellow peers? <coughs> we, uh, continually, we continually included those who we saw at the, I worked for the VA, and we would seek the veterans um, desires on that to ask them as part of um, family cultural competency. We would get the release of information and ask if they wanted family members included on the treatment plan. And uh, when they did, they would accompany them. And it usually created a stronger support base than for them just to feel as if they were sort of alone. But then again, we were very recovery oriented, very um, person centric in our approach to things, very strengths-based. So it may be more so the, the paradigm or the mindset that you come into that with. Mm -hmm. Right. Which VA are you with? 
Uh, now I'm with Loma Linda in California, but um, when I was in Seattle, Washington, we were very, very big on incorporating families. And it also um, became uh, part of the uh, some of the CARF accreditation also to see if we were seeking that. And in the fidelity reviews that we would experience in the individual place and support model, uh, we needed to adhere to that as well. I like to point out a study that was just done two years ago at the VA in Bedford, Massachusetts, just west of Boston, where um, they were trying to get more veterans to participate in the supported employment program. So they did a controlled study. One group went alone, and the other group brought a family member. Which one do you think got more people into supported employment? More than likely the family member did a similar yeah. study a couple of years ago By as well. About by about 600 percent yes yes more absolutely. people so okay we have some yeah we have some questions here um we can take a look at um first one is from tanya in illinois uh, employment first manager for the department of health services i think she says do family to family class options exist in a distance learning format for those who might not be able to get there that's for Kathleen. That's, that's an excellent question. Um, and uh, as, as of now, it, it, is, it is not in that kind of format because uh, the dynamics of the class are so important. Um, you know, families as well as peers often feel so isolated. And sometimes they really do feel like pariahs. Uh, so the idea of coming together, I mean, I have taught family to family classes where there are people in the class who wanted the shades pulled down uh, mm -hmm. because they were so shamed to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's really, uh, you know, it may, it may become something that uh, for practical purposes is offered uh, in distance learning, but, but not currently. I remember um, meeting a couple, and their daughter had been ill for about 15 years, and they said they had never spoken to another human being other than her doctor mm -hmm. about anything to do with her issue. It's remarkable. OK, we have De um, Delete, I think the name is. Kati, in oh, Kati is in for Delete, Canadian Mental Health Association, York Region, Ontario. Uh, is part of our strategic plan in the next three years to involve families more in individuals' recovery and vocational goals. This will be useful to bring to the team to assist our workers in involving families. Wonderful. Great to hear from you. Did you ever hear of Port, ever hear of Port Colburn? <laughs> That's near where my family is from in Ontario. I have a question on the phone. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned earlier that HIPAA didn't apply to employment, and I was curious what you meant by that. Oh, thank you. Yes, well, is there an echo? Can you hear me? Um, anyway, I think that, that we are all very conditioned to, uh, to confidentiality surrounding HIPAA. And... Um, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's a non-issue. I mean, there are so many jokes about HIPAA, but it, this is kind of a joke. It has nothing to do with employment. Yeah, well, I think it's also, question? Yeah, um, it's also primarily, about, primarily about electronic uh, medical records. Um, it doesn't mean there are no confidentiality issues involved with vocational services, especially because you're still obtaining medical records from other places. And so you, those, there are all kinds of protections on those. Some are federal, some are state, some are from CARF, and so forth. So um, it's not that there's no confidentiality records, but they're greatly exaggerated, I think is what Kathleen is saying, is that um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's a lot of room for dialogue with families. And um, you know, it's not that the families are going to be doing it behind the, their family members back. Um, this whole webinar is about partnership, and that's 
sort of a three-way partnership between the family member, the, the person who's the job seeker, and the provider. Because so we work for a mental health agency, so we're and we follow the IPS model, and so we're bound by HIPAA. We have to follow HIPAA. There's no gray area for us. Well, uh, so let me ask you then, do you involve families? We do if we have a release of information from the client, but only if the client wants their family members to be involved. Just like with following the IPS model, we can't talk to an employer on the client's behalf unless the client has signed an ROI for us. I'm wondering um, in I'm wondering about a couple of things uh, as far as I mean I know a lot of peers who <coughs> said to them do you want to work would say no I don't want to work um, and I think that can be a lot of reasons why I think it can be fear I think it can be lack of confidence uh, I think it can be stigma um, and so I'm wondering, uh, is, is motivational interviewing used much in, um, in as far as, as bringing people to the point where they're considering uh, getting a job? And we also, use that a great deal here. Oh, terrific. And also as far as soliciting consent for family involvement. Because, uh, you know, to say, well, you know, do you think that things would go better with your family? Can we talk a little bit about your family? Is that the kind of thing that happens? I don't know. We have a lot of um, very in-depth discussions with our clients about disclosure and the different types of disclosure and how involved or not involved the different um, ROIs would be. So we definitely have these discussions with them, but like I said, we're bound by HIPAA with where we work. And so because well, we're there also HIPAA. there's yeah. There are many different confidentiality laws besides HIPAA. HIPAA right. is primarily concerned with um, electronic medical records, but there are other confidentiality laws. For example, the people who um, work in a VR state agency. They have there's a whole um, set of regulations which are actually implemented on a state level. The state goes by the general guidelines from the federal government and then issues. There are, um, if people are CARF accredited, they have their own standards. So there are many, you know, those are only a couple examples, but there are many different confidentiality issues. But the thing is to know what applies in your particular situation and um, <clears throat> what the best way is to um, find out what the job seeker or the potential job seeker um, would like to do? Who would they like to be involved to help them? And they, they may be people they haven't even thought of that they that could be involved. Hi, my name is Mary Shepler and I'm an IPS trainer in Illinois and I just, um, this conversation is making me think of one of the things, I'm, I'm on a family team in our state that is working to try to see how we can increase uh, family supports, natural supports, um, and, you know, involve employment specialists to help to create those relationships. And one of the tools that a colleague of mine is working on is creating an advocacy tool, kind of a one page, that will help individuals even start having conversations independently with family members and or other natural supports um, to kind of begin practicing around that and what that feels like. And as that confidence grows, if that's something that feels, you know, that they feel good about of having those conversations, how that can um, go into the conversation with any requirements around releases of information and making the employment specialist be sure on their end that they are um, respecting their clients' rights. But again, a nice way to kind of start that conversation and build individual advocacy when talking to family members about, you know, their goals and, and their dreams. That sounds great. Hey, where, where, are you, where are you from? Illinois. Illinois. From what kind of a program? Uh, so we're with the IPS state training team. Oh, the state training team. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I think that um, that one of the studies that I mentioned, the um, Michael Cohen study about uh, family advocacy for the IPS supported model, um, talks about NAMI groups uh, getting involved in this. And I think that, that NAMI Illinois uh, has been pretty active. I don't know if they are right now in this. Yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Are there any family members on the line? Yes, not anybody that wishes to say that. that um, anyhow. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if other people have come from uh, states or regions where um, families have been included, uh, either as advocates and um, regarding vocational services or on an individual basis, you find that it um, has sort of um, happens naturally, organically, or is it like uh, the woman who just spoke where they're trying to sort of survey people and see like what kind of structure could there be to um, <clears throat> be inclusive? Any other experiences? Hello? So, this is um, Becky Sterling, um, and I'm with Virginia and the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. And I had come on board for the webinar, I think, just to learn more. Um, and my interest is that our uh, peer recovery specialists um, are often helping people with employment. Um, so anything that I can add to their skill set um, is beneficial. And we're starting to look at working with our um, Department of Voc Rehab and uh, do some uh, employment first training modules um, and offering that to the peer recovery specialist. And then um, when we're certifying peer recovery specialists, uh, we're certifying family support partners at the same time. Yeah. Um, I just want what to is mention. The role, yeah, what is the role of the of the of your family support partner? Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Joanne, the journal's being all crazy here. Um, I guess he's been calling the post office like every day, demanding that if. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we have a couple conversations going on here. Um, I just wanted to respond to the person who spoke a little while ago about uh, the peer support uh, folks trying to get more involved in employment. I'm going to mention somebody from our center who has been um, who developed uh, training and research on that particular issue. Her name is. Debbie Nicolellis, and I'll put her number down here. It's just our center's number, which is, I'll write it down here. If you want to uh, give her a call, she can uh, tell you everything we've been doing along those lines. Um, but I'd love to hear what other people are doing in terms of uh, the peer specialist. Um, Peer and family, I know I spoke to some people from Iowa, and they had a, some kind of um, peer and family uh, program going on. But it, they changed healthcare organizations, and the program was dropped. So I don't know ever, whatever became of that. But um, yeah, tell us some more about peers, learning more about vocational uh, services, and how to be helpful, and, and, it, and how, in fact, they might work with family members as well. Uh, 
um, I, again, Becky, I, I inadvertently um, dropped off and had to come back on and, of course, missed most of your reply. It's been that kind of a day. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think of a couple of situations where, and, and this is related again to peer specialists, where the employment has come through becoming a peer specialist and, and family members have almost been pleasantly surprised um, that the person was successful with employment. Um, I don't think that they were resistant, I just don't think that they were able to see the possibilities um, because their concerns were shadowing that. I do know a lot of family members who uh, who are un unsure if their um, person is able to work. Uh, I don't think that that's an unusual um, reaction, and to have them pleasantly surprised. Um, I think we need to be doing more talking about recovery. I, I certainly feel that the, the certified peer specialist role is, is a vital one um, in so many respects. One of the and things I think that, that we, it is a stepping stone. Yes, I'm sorry, Joan, you go. No, this is, this is Becky again. One of the things oh. that we observed was um, that because we do the same training, for the peer recovery specialist as for the um, family support partner. Um, mm -hmm. Therefore, you know, you've got the family and the mm -hmm. peer receiving the same training. That dynamic is very interesting also um, yeah. because we're finding that it changes the family member's perspective about what their loved one can and cannot do um, mm -hmm. and kind of challenges some of the limited thinking that we've been taught as family members or, or experience perhaps. Um, but then that's, that's just one segment of employment. I mean, you know, when we think of people overcoming um, behavioral health challenges, uh, employment's far broader than just peer recovery specialists. Um, so. Well, I'd like to think of the, the same principle applying to education. I'm going to make this a three-way thing, um, family members, peers, and staff. And that's in terms of the real, the real information about benefits, uh, incentives, disincentives, and so forth, because as I've said a thousand times, I've never met anybody that's been in this field in any capacity that hasn't gotten wrong information. And uh, I was at a, a conference recently, and uh, this woman went, was kind of going from person to person saying, I've got this situation, and I'm, get, I'm going to be getting um, unemployment insurance, and I have this, and, I, and what should I do? And I said, first of all, you shouldn't be asking me. <laughs> um, you really want an expert. And, and I think that that 65% that Kathleen mentioned of people interested in employment would be much greater if people really understood the actual facts about Social Security, veterans benefits, and all of that, because they get so much bad information. They get so many warnings about, well, don't do this and don't do that because you're going to lose this and can you lose that. And it's 90% of it is gossip and hearsay, and it has nothing to do with the facts of the matter. And in fact, sometimes Social Security doesn't even know the rules. But you know, find out who, who are the, the champions and the experts on this and get the information from that. And I think we'd see that 65% go up a lot higher because it's both the individual and the family members are frightened about the, the whole financial picture and uh, medical benefits and so forth, and and I I hear a lot, a lot, a lot of staff people um, getting wrong information and giving wrong information. So I think there's like this 
snowstorm of wrong information that is the number one thing that gets in the way of people working. You know, I don't know any survey that's ever been done about barriers to employment where it doesn't come up as either the first or the second thing on the list. So, you know, so I want to put in a pitch for people. Um, if they can learn, the, learn it together, then they can be educated together about this and a whole bunch of other things. And I want to put in a pitch for, um, for families realizing that recovery is real. And um, my daughter and I were talking just over the weekend about an individual and his family and her saying, he's not there, yes, but he will be. Recovery is real. It's, it's interesting because I think, I know when I first started, experiencing recovery and, and thinking about recovery for other people. Um, I was not family focused in my thoughts at all. Um, and and the, the dawning awareness that uh, the individual's aware wellness affects the family dynamics. And so when we talk about holding hope um, as the individual begins to realize possibilities, it really is the family that can begin to hold that hope. And, um, maybe see that that light at the end of the tunnel. Absolutely, it is it is a, it is a dance. Yep. Um, Barry mentions that he's developed a PowerPoint about uh, veterans benefits uh, in relation to um, impact on wages and benefits. I've also developed one, so I'm suggesting that we swap. <laughs> um, oh, his business includes SSI and SSDI. It sounds even better. Great. Okay, and we have Autumn uh, from Wichita, Kansas, um, employment specialist for an IPS program. What about the parent family that is over-involved to the point of detriment to the person with the mental health issues? <clears throat> um, you know, I'd just like to say a word uh, about that. Um, I recall in the early days of our family uh, going to um, family meetings at uh, evening meetings at, at what was a day program, a, a good day program, and having, uh, there were many people from other cultures, um, really a broad array of cultures. Uh, and it was in New Jersey. And <clears throat> I found that people from other cultures were so very different in their involvement with their loved one. Um, it, was, it was family first, family first. And it was very different from my culture. Um, so so I, I don't know. I'd like to know, I'd love to know more. What, what does it mean to be over-involved? Could you expand on that a little bit? Is it, is it a cultural thing? Is it an educational issue? Is it a socioeconomic one? What do you think? Autumn, I think you're the one that asked the question. You got any thoughts on that? Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think that um, the biggest issue is that the client um, is the only family member that they know of with a mental illness. He's 19 and he's been very sheltered and the parents feel like um, there's a lot that he can't do. Um, 
they're his legal guardians. Um, I can't speak to the client um, without the parents. The parents usually text me to find out about meetings or to cancel meetings and that sort of thing. And I think it kind of um, gets in the way of me finding him employment. Mm -hmm. You know, I just went to a unfortunate yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. I just went to a workshop on something very much like this at the um, our PRA organization in Massachusetts, and it was done by the Brian Center from Western Massachusetts, B-R-I-E-N, um, where they were using a, oh, I'm sorry, and the um, advocates, the organization is called Advocates, where they're doing a version of Open Dialogue. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Founded in Finland? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where for somebody of his age group, and where they spend an enormous amount of time at the very beginning when the first person is first becoming, uh, having difficulties um, with the young person and the family. And there's a whole um, interaction that happens. There are two people that are trained to work with the family, with the person present. And they did, they did a sort of a model um, of how it works. And it was really... Um, remarkable how much they were able to get done and by really spending a lot of time with the family and the, the youngster together. And then the, the young person also had their own therapist and um, different kinds of supports. But the work that was done with the family and the person together, now in that, this, that case it wasn't uh, focused on employment, so that would be the difference. But um, I think by um, paying attention to both of them at the same time in a sort of dialogue, that the the overpowering wasn't wasn't happening. They didn't allow it to happen because they had the skills to figure out how to make it come together without being without any one member of the team being overpowered by it. So I think it's just, it's, you know, they're different personalities, and as Kathleen says, different cultures um, where people may be feeling, you know, left out or um, frustrated or whatever that the feeling is. But if, if somehow the, you know, the solution isn't just to, to leave somebody out, um, I but to, find to help them participate you know, in a good way. And I also find with uh, uh, NAMI groups, uh, whether it's a family-to-family -family group, a 12-week group, where it's certainly not a support group, but the members of the class, perhaps 20, 22 members of a class, become very close and very supportive of one another. They, uh, <clears throat> they're, they're vocal in, in their opinions. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, you know it becomes it, you know it becomes normalizing, um, or in a support group uh, to to with the more people learn um, accurate information, I think the less fearful they become. They don't feel like they've landed on the planet Mars. And it sounds like this is a young man, 19 years old. Maybe he hasn't been ill for such a long time. It does take a long time to get used to this new way of living and this new person. Absolutely. Thank you. I just it was having a flash of current politics, and I was thinking of you know people who were who are sort of loud advocates about something, and you know the they may the solution desired solution may be just to find a way to get rid of them, <laughs> to put them out someplace where you can't hear their voices because uh, they're making everyone upset, um, and so you know as Americans I guess. We we don't want to we don't want people to be left out, but we want it to be productive. 
and we want it to be, you know, uh, helpful and supportive. Any other comments, questions, parting messages? Kathleen, do you have some like final messages that you'd like to leave? Well, well, I do. Uh, I do. I think that uh, for any of the providers on the line, uh, I think that one of your really good referrals would be to refer to uh, the, the family's uh, NAMI group. Uh, so they could really, you know, enhance their own situation, get back to normal living, resume some of their activities, um, realize that life goes on and people continue to develop. Uh, it takes a long while to get used to the idea that uh, you have a loved one. Uh, a child, for example, that you brought into the world that has this very common but severe disability and that uh, that you realize, as I said, that life goes on uh, and that there's a quality of life and that employment is one of the goals and one of the strategies to achieve uh, a quality of life to to be able to have uh, income uh, and uh, and rent uh, and maybe even a date on Saturday night. So I think that that's my mm. parting message. I can tell you that uh, that our family is in an excellent place, and I wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, it's really a, a great uh, uh, find, like a treasure, to find somebody like you that's passionate about employee, employment and that can share these ideas. And um, I hope that all of our participants will give it some thought and um, be willing to, um, if you think of something that you didn't get a chance to share uh, today on the phone or in the chat box, please send me an email. And when I send out the um, recorded version to everyone, I'll be able to include what you what you wanted to share. And uh, I wish you all happy holidays. And um, stay in touch for our next uh, installment, which will be uh, towards the, uh, the the last Wednesday of November on uh, employment collaboratives. So thank you all for for your participation. Bye-bye.